The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. I'd like to welcome you to Southside Bible Church. For those of you who are guests, we pray that you find the one true God of the Bible living in the lives of His people, proclaiming His Word, proclaiming His truth. So would you join me as we open in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, for sending him to die. And we thank you that he didn't stay in the grave, but he rose and he lives. And we thank you for sending your Spirit so that we might live through him. So we pray that this word that your Spirit has brought would be proclaimed by your Spirit this morning. And it's in your Son's name we pray these things. Amen. So a pastor was once asked how he would preach through Numbers 26, a 65-verse recitation of almost exclusively names starting with the original 12 tribes of Israel to the current family names of that time. This is the parishioner's equivalent of watching paint dry. So the pastor's reply was simply, quickly. So this morning we find ourselves in the middle of a lengthy judgment passage, and just as we illustrated concerning Numbers 26, we may be tempted to blow through it quickly. However, as is the case with the Word of God, there's much to glean from these verses. So we will look at these judgment passages in detail this morning. Not because I want you to learn how to watch paint dry, but because I want you to see an excellent God who is still an excellent God in the midst of judgment. So please turn with me, if you would, to the book of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, and we'll be looking at chapter 2, verse 9, and we'll go through chapter 3, verse 2 this morning. For those of you who like outlines, we're in the middle of a section where God is responding to the second prayer of the prophet. His first prayer was praying through injustice, and God responded with who he was. The second prayer of the prophet was praying in the midst of confusion, and now God is responding with what he does. We've already seen him proclaim his plans, proclaim how he sustains life. And we have looked at the first woe, which is in verses 6 through 8, where God proclaimed, I will judge through our nation, other nations. Now we will look at verses 9 through 11, where God proclaims that he'll destroy security. And verses 12 through 14, that he is exalted in his judging Verses 15 through 17, that he will bring the Babylonians to shame. Verses 18 through 19, he shows the futility of idolatry. And verse 20, he shows that he is alive and that he rules. And then in chapter 3, we start the heading of the prophet's third prayer, which I uh, titled Praying Through Tragedy. And uh, verses 1 through 2 concentrates on fear and mercy. So let's pick it up in verses 9 through 11. It says, Woe to him who gets evil gain from his house to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. You have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples. So you're sinning against yourself. Surely the stone will cry out from the wall. And the rafter will answer from the framework. So if you recall, in chapter 1, verse 16, the prophet said, Because through these things, through their violence, their catch is large and their food is plentiful. Meaning that the Babylonians were going to come in and they had already demonstrated their ability of coming in and taking over and taking for themselves. Well, in this section, they were taking. And what they were taking had to do with Not monetary gain per se, but this time inanimate objects such as stone and lumber. 
And it's not necessarily the spoils of war that is being condemned, but how it is being used. So Babylon was taking these things, the stone and the wood, and they were creating for themselves for a, a nest, so to speak, or a house, a place on high, where they could securely keep themselves from the outside world. The city of Babylon was massive at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Historically speaking, according to the Greek writer uh, and geographer Herodotus, Babylon had walls so thick that they, had, uh, that they would hold chariot rides on them, or chariot races. There were three sets of walls, boom, 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 40 feet high. The city inside the walls was some 200 square miles. This is roughly the size of Chicago. So Babylon, therefore, had secured itself and secured itself with the wealth of other nations. And in that, they rested, in that security. But God proclaims that you're separating yourselves. You've devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples. So Proverbs 26.6 reads, He who cuts off, katsa is the Hebrew, katsa, katsa, cut off, uh, his own feet and, uh, and drinks violence who sends a message by the hand of a fool. So uh, in that proverb, it's giving a very clear picture 26.6, it's giving a very clear picture that you can hurt your own self by trying to protect your own self. And that's exactly what Babylon was doing. It was protecting itself from other people, and therefore it cut itself off from other people to secure itself. I'll protect myself. I want you to hold on to that thought because we're going to come back to it. So what cries out? Surely the stone will cry out from the wall. And in uh, the NAS, it says the rafter from the framework. The word framework, um, eats is the Hebrew word, can also be translated just wood or timber. And so as, as wall is to stone, right? A wall is made of stone. So are rafters made of wood. And so what he's talking about are these inanimate objects. He's talking about the stone and the wood. And it's saying they're going to cry out in judgment against the Babylonians. So how do you, got, how do you get inanimate objects to cry out? Why would inanimate objects cry out? Well, in a different context, but nonetheless, in Luke 19.40, Jesus is being instructed by the Pharisees, have everybody stop praising you. Help, have them all shut up. This isn't right for them to praise you. As he was making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That's the context. And Jesus says, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Inanimate objects. Why? Why would stones cry out? Why would stones cry out? Why would wood cry out? Who's really the voice? It would be God himself, the creator of these things, to speak truth and to speak judgment. So if you recall in verse 13 of chapter 1, the prophet was saying, why are you silent? And here we have even the rafters even the walls crying out, saying judgment. God's not silent. That's what he's declaring to him. He's not silent in judge, judgment. Judgment's coming, and he's the one that will declare it. So I want us to come back to a thought, this thought of isolation, this thought of cutting oneself off. I want us to grab hold of that just for a minute. Proverbs 18.1 says, He who separates himself seeks his own desire, he quarrels against all sound wisdom. Why do we separate ourselves? Why do we separate ourselves from family? Why do we separate ourselves from friends? Why do we separate ourselves from the body of Christ? And this proverb would say, we do so because we seek our own way. Well, no, they're all her heretical people. And I wish that were true, if you separate yourself from everybody and you're calling everybody a heretic, is everybody really a heretic? No. 
You separate yourself because you want your own way. No, I'm, I'm protecting myself. Yeah, you're protecting yourself from getting hurt. Who you're protecting? Yourself. It's about yourself. It's about myself. So there's a warning in there, even in this judgment for us, that we can take and apply to ourselves and say, may I not be one who separates myself to seek my own way, but one who seeks to be a part. All right, moving on to the next section, the next woe. This is our third woe, verses 12 through 14. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed the Lord of hosts? The peoples toil for fire and nations grow weary for, for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as, as the waters cover the sea. This might seem a bit confusing, but um, again, recall back in 113, the prophet said, why do you look at favor with those who deal treacherously? Why do you look positively at people who do violence? And God's making it very clear to Habakkuk, I don't. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds it with a town with violence. So we've moved now from a people who are take financially and gain by loans. We uh, look at a, at a city established by taking from others. And now we look at a people who is a violent people living treacherously. And God's saying, whoa, I'm going to deal with them. Whoa, I judge them. So what's this uh, verse 13? What's it saying? Uh, is, it, is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts? Um, hosts, armies, God, it's usually uh, a picture in the Old Testament of God in battle array. Is it not from the Lord of hosts that the people toil for fire, the nations grow weary for nothing? So what's this really getting at? Um, Jeremiah 51, 58 gives us a much clearer picture of exactly what he means by this. Okay, here's what it says. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the broad wall of Babylon, that's what we just talked about, will be completely raised and her high gates will be set on fire so the peoples will toil for nothing and the nations become exhausted only for fire. Okay, do you get it? This is what he's saying. He's saying everything that they toiled and labored for to build and to make is going to be destroyed. It's going to go, it's going to come to naught. And who is it from? The Lord of hosts. The Lord of glory. So in verse 14, we read this. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Kavod, Hebrew, Kavod of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So, whatever this is, this as the waters cover the sea, it's, he's creating a picture that is deep and it's broad. And it's, so what is going to cover the earth deeply and broadly? It's going to be the knowledge of, of the glory of the Lord. So in Exodus 29, 42 through 45, God's glory is associated with the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. In 1 Samuel 4, 21, God's glory is associated with the ark. In 1 Kings 8, 11, the glory of the Lord is associated with the temple. Okay, and all of those things do associate the glory of the Lord, but what declares the knowledge, yada, of the glory of the Lord? Well, in Psalms uh, 19.1, it says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. That's what we call general revelation, the general revelation of who God is. They declare his glory. But what else declares his glory? Pastor Andreas read this morning, Psalm 29. Who declares the glory of the Lord? His people declare his glory. 
If you go back through Psalm 29, you will see glory and you'll see a declaration, declare, 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 and they speak of the glory of God. So I want us to recall, what was one of the prophet's concerns? He was concerned that the righteous were going to go extinct. Judah was going to be wiped out. Who's going to be left? The evil, wicked nation continues throughout the earth. They continue going. Who's going to be left? What is this verse saying? The earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Deeply, widely, vastly. This nation, Judah, gets judged and in a way has a forced kind of missionary work because they're pushed out amongst, amongst the nations. If you are here this morning, And you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. You declare the glory of God. You are a fulfillment of this promise. You declare the glory of God. And where do we sit? In Denver, Colorado, Centennial, Colorado, in the middle of North America, thousands of miles away from Jerusalem, Israel. And yet, God's glory is declared. Let's move on. Verses 15 through 17. Woe to you who make your your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk, so as to look at their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourselves drink and expose your own nakedness, The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will become upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and the devastation of its beasts by which you terrified them, because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its inhabitants. Yep, some deep judgment language. So we've talked about their city. We've talked about how they established that city in violence. And now we're talking about some of the activities that they would do. We've uh, spoken of Babylon being heavy wine drinkers before in the past, but here's a different picture. They're taking that alcohol now and they're using it as a means by which to shame other people. Right? You can think of this as kind of almost a modern day roofie um, taking something to drug someone up so as to take advantage of them in some way. Um, so what's the part about venom? Um, there's, there's nothing significant uh, historically about mixing venom with uh, wine. Um, venom is a different uh, form of a poison. It's not a direct poison. It's not caustic, and therefore you can drink it, but, but its effects are zero. It just goes through you. Um, so there's no, no real effect here, but don't focus in on the venom, but the fact that it says your venom. You mix this drink with your venom. And so if you look at Psalm 58, 1 through 5, a, wicked's man in, a wicked, wicked man's intentions are associated with venom. So what it's really saying is you're taking this alcohol and you're using it with evil intention, your venom. Their intention is to expose, to shame these people, to take advantage of them. And so what does God say then? He says, you will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourselves drink and expose your nakedness. So they're the ones that are going to be shamed. By who now? By God. Now the question is, what cup are they drinking? What cup are they drinking? It says the cup in the Lord's right hand. All right? If we look at Jeremiah 25, 15 through 16, the cup of the Lord is judgment, God's wrath. It's very clear. Why the right hand? The right hand was the sword hand. Sorry, lefties. Not not to left you or leave you out. It's the judgment hand, the sword hand. From his hand, from his right hand, you will drink the cup of his wrath. 
So is, I'm going to go back to it again, is God silent in injustice? No. Just from his limited perspective, the prophet's limited perspective, sure he was. But ultimately in the grand scheme of eternity, God was not silent. God was speaking loudly. He would judge. So what's this bit about verse 17? For the violence done to Lebanon... Uh, will overwhelm you. Isn't Lebanon a separate country from Israel? Modern day, yes. But the, the trees or the area known as Lebanon was a part of the promised land and thus a part of Israel. And what was it known for? It's elegant trees. Um, it's, it's beauty, the trees of Lebanon. And so there's violence done to the foliage. There's violence done to the animals. There's violence done to humans. And if you look all the way back at Genesis 9, 5, God's really clear, makes it very clear at the time of Noah, just as Noah's getting off the ark, that God's very particular and God will judge the way we treat animals as well as humans. And we are, we are not supposed to be cruel. We aren't called to be cruel. And then all the way back, we can go all the way back to Genesis 2. What was man cared to be, uh, called to be? A caretaker. A caretaker of God's creation. They're a destroyer. God's saying, you're destroying everything that I have established as good and right. I will judge you for it. I will judge you for it. And so, understand that God cares for his creation. He does. We are to be good stewards. Don't, I'm not advocating being tree huggers, etc. What I am advocating is we are called to this earth and we are called to care for it well. So let us do that. The Babylonians did not. And the Babylonians were severely judged. God's declaring, this is how I'll judge him. So that leads us to the final woe, the final section where he's now going to expose what they trust in besides security and strongholds. God asks, what profit is the idol when its maker has carved it? Or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in its own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to, who, woe to him who says to a piece of wood, awake, to a mute stone, arise. And that is your teacher? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside. So God's declaring the futility, the worthlessness of idolatry. Yeah, it's pretty. That's about all it is. It doesn't speak, it only teaches in the sense that it instructs away from God because as the person fashions it, the person puts its trust in this thing that it has created and made pretty and invested. And what does it instruct? Away from God. Trust in this thing. And he's saying there's no life. Idols don't speak. Idols don't hear, idols don't see, idols don't taste, idols don't touch. They're worthless. They're dead. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal. Why? Hey, hey, yell a little louder, scream a little louder, maybe your God's asleep. They cried, they cut themselves. And, and did, did anything happen to their sacrifice? For those of you who know the story, you know the answer is no. Nothing. And then Elijah prays, and it consumes everything. As God declared himself to be God. And then we get this profound statement as God ends all that he's saying. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Temple um, can also be translated or understood as palace. 
And it's putting God up in a position of absolute authority, saying, I'm there. And it's an is statement. It's not that he was. It's not that he's going to be. It's that he is there. That means he was, and that means he still is, and that means he always will be. God who sits above all the earth. And then this Hebrew word, hasa, hush. Let the earth be silent. And actually that, that silent part is brought to the forefront of the statement. Let the whole earth Shh, be quiet. In Nehemiah 8.11, this is the same words translated as be still. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Jesus and the Gospels, does this bring to mind any certain situation? Like Mark 4.39, where Jesus in the boat, winds, waves, and what happens? Jesus comes and says, shh, hush, be still. Same type of thought. So yes, in that, um, I'm talking about the mountain, this Mark passage, in that moment, God declares, or Jesus is declaring, I'm God by his strength and power over creation. But there's even a tie back to this, where God has declared himself, let the earth be silent. So there's even a little bit more there, I think, that declares Jesus as God in that statement. So in summary, God's, God's calling for reverence. Because he ultimately is in control of everything. No nation, no prophet, no person can stand before him and declare anything. He's in control, period. You and I are not. We may not like our current circumstances. We may not like our past. We may not like many things. But we, all of us, need to remember to whom it is that we complain when we do complain. He is the same God that brings down nations to declare himself glorious, holy. He is God. So that brings us to the end of chapter 2 and the end of God's declaration. And we pick it up in chapter 3, verse 1, where it says a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Sigayon. So, what is Sigayon? What does that mean? Um, it's a word, Hebrew year, word, only used one of the time in, uh, in the Old Testament. It's in Psalm 7.1, and it's used similarly. Uh, and if you read through the seventh Psalm, what you will find is a very similar structure and a very similar feel to what we will read in chapter 3 of Habakkuk. So that means that this is communicating um, an attitude, if you would, of how this is musically supposed to be accompanied. So for you musicians out there, if I say uh, we should play something adagio, what am I saying? Slow. Thank you. Thank you, musicians. <clears throat> slow. You want me to play slowly. You're telling me how to do it, but you're using a word, and it's a word that musicians are familiar with, adagio. Now, if I tell you I want you to play adagio for strings, now what am I telling you? to play a specific piece. And for those of you who recognize what that piece is, you probably heard it in a movie. And I'm not going to tell you what movie it is. 
Um, but what I will tell you is if you know what movie it is, you know what scene it is, and it sticks with you in your head. I'm going to ask you, why do you think it sticks with you? Why, do you, why does that scene, scene stick with you in your head? I'm going to suggest that it's because it was accompanied by a very emotional piece of music that really drew you into what was going on in that scene. Adagio for strings. So similarly, Sigayoth is, is this emotional piece of music that is supposed to be accompanied with what he is going over in poetry. So how do I know it's a musical piece? If you skip all the way down to the very last part of the chapter, you see, for the choir director on my stringed instruments. There you go. It's a musical piece. So it was supposed to be accompanied with music. It's supposed to emotionally draw the person into what is being said and attach you to it so that you can remember it, remember what's being said. So with that, let's go ahead and step into the text with verse 2, where we'll end this morning. He says, Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. So he says, Yahweh, Yare, Yahweh, Yare, I fear, I fear. So I heard of you, and I fear. And the question is, what kind of fear are we talking about? Psalm 27.3 uses the same word, and it gives the idea of being afraid of something. And is there um, the possibility that we're talking about that kind of fear? And the answer is actually yes. Um, in 3.16, same verse, he he says, or same chapter, he says, I, I heard and my inward parts trembled at the sound of my lips quivered, decay entered my bones, and in, in my place I trembled. Okay, that's, I'm scared. That's, I'm scared. So if this is speaking of that kind of fear, what would he be afraid of? The judgment coming, right? So there's a legitimate fear. Okay, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is understanding this as deep reverence, as, is, as it's uh, yare is translated in Psalm twenty two twenty three. 23. Same word for fear, but in that case, it's reverence. And if I link uh, 220 with 32, where God's basically saying, give me reverence, I believe it links best with 32 saying, I, I, I've heard about you, and I reverence you. I reverence you. I acknowledge that you are who you say you are. I bow my knee to you now. As you have declared, so let it be. Judgment it is. So let it be. You are God. It's reverence. So let it be. It's one of the reasons why we say amen. Let it be so. Amen. So he starts with reverence and then he moves to, O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. This is a really deeply heartfelt statement. He begs God, but what is he begging God for? He uses this phrase, in the midst of the years. Um, it, it basically means over the course of time and usually not anytime soon. But in the course of time, he says, make it known. And, the, and so that begs the question, make what known? And then he, then he repeats, in the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. So what was coming? What was coming? Judgment. Wrath. Wrath was coming. So what is he asking for? Is he asking for no wrath? And, and it's, that's, it's not it. He's already accepted judgment's coming, wrath is coming. 
What he's asking for is declare yourself, make yourself known another aspect about you. Another aspect other than that you're just. Make it known that you're merciful. And he's saying in the midst of the years, so it might not be now, it might not be soon, but someday, one day, would you declare your mercy? So what is mercy? What is raham? What is mercy? Not the same as grace. People often confuse those, say they're the same thing, grace and mercy, grace and mercy. Um, We receive grace and mercy. We receive them both, but they are not the same thing. Grace is receiving or getting a benefit or a favor that you don't deserve. So it's getting a plus that you didn't deserve, that you didn't earn. Mercy is different. Mercy is that you have earned something. You and I have earned judgment. You and I have earned justice. You and I have earned it. But you and I, if you have come to know Christ, will not receive the wrath of God because the wrath of God was laid upon Christ. That's mercy. So grace, just in very simple terms, is getting what you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Mercy. And you see, mercy cannot be shown unless some punishment has been earned. Okay? I I can't be ahead of somebody in a grocery line and say, well, go ahead of me. I'm going to show you mercy. That's, a, that's an improper understanding of what mercy is. Yeah, you're showing, you're being gracious, you're being kind, but that's not mercy. Mercy, we, in, in uh, rec league, football, baseball, basketball, they have the what rule? Mercy rule. And it's usually when someone's getting whooped up on, say, can we stop it now, please? Stop. That's that's probably what our best idea of mercy is, and it's not a very good one. Because a better idea of what mercy is has to do with an absolute monarch catching you in in some kind of a sin and saying, you deserve death. And in an absolute monarchy, there is no court of appeals. There's no, I've got more evidence. No, in an absolute monarchy, there's an absolute declaration, you are guilty. Recompense is demanded. Death is demanded. And so mercy would be for that monarch to say, and you, you go free. I release you. You go free. That's mercy. Now in the economy of God that compromises justice because justice isn't served. But in the economy of God, justice was served. You and I do get to go free, but justice was served on the cross of Christ. Mercy is something that should mean something very deeply, very meaningful, to every believer in here. It should hit you at your very core. If you know Christ, you know mercy. In Psalm 103.13, it associates fearing God with receiving mercy. In Proverbs 28.13, it associates confessing sin with receiving mercy. In Micah 7.19, there's a promise of future mercy. And then I want to look at the one here in Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30, verse 18, with respect to mercy. Isaiah 30, verse 18 says, Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore He waits on high to have compassion. That's, that's our word for mercy. Rakam. On you. For the Lord is a God of Justice, 
How blessed are those who long for him. He's a God of justice, and he is a God of mercy. So, jumping back to Habakkuk and what, what's said here. In the years, Lord, in the midst of the years, in your judgment, would you show mercy? If you read the book of Ezra, God remembers mercy in judgment. If you read the book of Nehemiah, God remembers mercy in judgment. If you read the book of Esther, God remembers mercy in judgment. God answers this prayer. If you sit here as a believer in Jesus Christ, God remembers mercy in judgment. So I'm going to close by pleading with you. If you don't know Christ, if you don't know this Jesus, you, you know nothing of mercy. So I'm going to beg you, come to him this morning. Will you? Will you come to a very merciful God while there is still time? Come and receive mercy. For those of you who are believers, will you rejoice in the mercy in which you have by showing mercy, by being children of your Father, by being merciful to a world that doesn't deserve it any more than you and I did. Be merciful. Because if you show no mercy, you show no association with the Father that you claim don't claim this God and show no mercy. It's not right. You mock his name. So this morning, we will be partaking of the Lord's table, and I want you to remember this. I want it to ring true in your mind, in your heart. Mercy. If you are a child of mercy and you're holding on to something, let it go. Because you, are, you and I have a merciful God. I close with this poem from Edward R. Sill. It says, The royal feast was done, the king sought some new sport to banish care, and to his jester cried, Sir fool, kneel now and make for us a prayer. The jester doffed his cap and bells and stood the mocking court before they could not see the bitter smile behind the painted grin he wore. He bowed his head and bent his knee upon the monarch's silken stool. His pleading voice arose, O Lord, be merciful to me, a fool. No pity, Lord, could change the heart from red with wrong to white as wool. The rod must heal the sin, but Lord, be merciful to me, a fool. Tis not by guilt the onward sweep of truth and right, O Lord, we stay. Tis by our follies that so long we hold the earth from heaven away. These clumsy feet, still in the mire, go crushing blossoms without end. These, hand, these hard, well-meaning hands we thrust among the heartstrings of a friend. The ill-timed truth we might have kept. Who knows how sharp it pierced and stung. The word we had no sense to say. Who knows how grandly it had rung. Our faults no tenderness should ask. The chastening stripes must cleanse them all. But for our blunders, oh, in shame, before the eyes of heaven we fall. Earth bears no balsam for mistakes. We men crown the knave and scourge the tool that did his will. But thou, O Lord, be merciful to me, a fool. The room was hushed and silence rose. The king and sought his gardens cool and walked apart. 
and murmured low, be merciful to me, a fool. Let's pray. God, you are the God of justice. But you are the God of mercy. We thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you do. And we thank you that we can rest in your finished work. Lord, I pray, grab a hold of anyone this morning who does not know you here. Open their eyes to see the mercy, the mercy of this God. We earned our way to be judged, and yet you gave us a way in your Son. We thank you for that. We thank you for this time. May we remember all that you've done this morning. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.